So I got off a call with a prospect that was referred to me for R&D tax credits a couple of days ago. And it was an interesting conversation because they said to me, no other R&D tax advisor has spoken to me in the way you spoke to me and give me some truths about it that I just simply wasn't aware of as an entrepreneur and asked really why this information isn't out there in the marketplace. And I promised I would do a video on it to help talk through the truths of the state of the nation in terms of where we are today in relation to the UK R&D tax relief. I think one of the key things to say to start with is I'm a chartered accountant, tax advisor, and I've been advising in this sector for like 20 odd years, more than 20 years. And I see it very much that I owe a duty of care to my clients and prospects even to make sure that they're going down the right path. And I think what this particular individual found is I think I was the third or fourth person they've spoken to in the R&D sort of tax specialist domain. And a lot of them have been kind of very salesy and yeah, 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 go for it, go for it, go for it. I had a quick look at the website before I got on the call and I could see there were some flags were raised from my side in terms of what might mean they don't qualify for R&D tax relief. So I went completely honestly uh, to talk about, you know, didn't conclude anything, but very much raising the issues they need to think about and explaining the things that need to be known when you are going down the path of R&D tax credit relief as an entrepreneur founder. Um, in today's marketplace. I'm recording this in November 2024. Be interested to see where we are by next year because a lot has changed. I mean, the relief came in in 2000 in, in the past two or three years. A huge amount has changed, as well as the actual rules around the relief in terms of the rates, etc., and the, the new merged uh, RD, RDEC or RDEC scheme um, and the changes to the SME relief. whole bunch of changes there, but it's more a kind of a climate change and more of a kind of a... Um, a difference in approach that HMRC are taking that's really important. I think you've got to be aware of that as if, if you are a founder, if you're already going on this path or you're thinking about it. So I thought I'd put together seven key insights really uh, in 2024. I suspect these will go into 2025 as well to simply start with, although I suspect we will see some changes. Uh, so let's kick, kick off with insight number one. And this is that HMRC can reclaim a tax credit payment they've already processed. So often there's a common misconception that once HMRC <coughs> pays out a tax credit payment into your bank account, that it's all done and dusted, that it's been agreed. Uh, this has kind of been fairly well trotted out, I think, by now, but still it seems to be missed by a lot of founders that this isn't the case. It just simply means they've processed it and they have the right to come back later on to challenge it. <coughs> so... How it strictly works is um, they have one year ordinarily from the filing date. Now, if you're a larger company, different rules apply, but ordinarily one year from the filing date, they can come back and ask questions on the claim and they can challenge the claim. It can be longer than that if it's an amended return because amended returns have a slightly different, it's the following quarter, the quarter after the um, uh anniversary of the filing date that makes sense and the quarters aren't obvious like 31st of jan 30th of april etc so it can be longer than um the typical anniversary of the filing date if you're in an amended return position if that makes sense again please reach out it's more specific advice it's kind of high level here um so and how R&D relief works. It's part of the corporation tax relief, company taxation. Every year, your company files statutory accounts with the company's house. You have a company corporation tax return that you file with HMRC uh, for a limited company in the UK. And the R&D relief forms part of that corporation tax return. Now, corporation tax in the UK operates under a system of um, self-assessment. So you self-assess, you say, I'm going to claim these reliefs and R&D might be one of them because we believe we are eligible and therefore we're going to put in the claim. And it's up for HMRC, up to HMRC later on to come back and say, you know, we disagree for these reasons and ask more questions, whatever it is. And the common kind of parlance for that is it's process now, pay later or process now, check later, I should say. So that's been the corporation tax regime for many, many years, um, and R&D really falls within that. Now, what has happened and where it's gone wrong, well, I think it's probably worth right in many ways, but come on to that in a second, is that this there's this assumption that once HMRC 
processes a payment and makes tax credit claim uh, payment, which is typically six, four to six weeks after you file the claim in most cases, then it's done and dusted. And it's this kind of was the case unofficially until about two years ago. So I remember having a chat with a caseworker, HMRC caseworker, inspector, and they said, you know, this was a few years ago, um, once we process a claim, from our perspective, we consider the case closed. Now, this was unofficial, just their personal view, and I never saw HMRC come back once they processed a claim. Ordinarily, if they were going to challenge a claim, they would challenge it before they paid it out, which makes complete sense. Um, because, you know, after all, many companies that are claiming this relief are SMEs, they're startups. They need this cash and they're going to use it. So to come back 12 months later asking for it back is ludicrous. But it happens. It is happening. So be aware of that. So HMRC can reclaim amounts they've already paid out to you. It's not agreed when they process it. They may have looked at it. You don't You don't know this. They don't write to you and say, oh, we've, we've reviewed it and we're happy with it. Um, the only way you know is if you get a letter say, where they say they're checking it. In this current climate, checking it new, normally means we're going to challenge it. Um, so kind of be aware that, that kind of wording is kind of sounds nice and friendly to start with from HMRC. You know, we're going to carry out a check of your uh, R&D tax relief claim. Ordinarily now, it means we're going to try and stop it, prevent it, get it back. Uh, that's a climate we're kind of in right now. Uh, number two is um, really a kind of a understanding for you to go into and in this case I was the third or fourth R&D advisor they'd spoken to in this particular case I'm referring to earlier this individual a lot of R&D advisors out there do, don't have any qualifications from a accountancy perspective so they're not qualified accountants and they're not qualified and or they're not qualified tax advisors anyone could set themselves up as an R&D tax specialist there are no kind of hurdles or gate, gateways into that and in the same way anyone can call themselves an accountant uh, you've got to check their credentials and HMRC are increasingly suggesting that you do this that you do go and check the credentials of the individuals that you're potentially being approached by or if you're looking at the marketplace for assistance with R&D relief um, you know I looked at, um, a few years ago possibly recruiting some help um, I looked on LinkedIn you know various other outfits out there R&D outfits that some people working there and I was surprised that a number of people had absolutely zero experience in accounting or tax prior to their role in these R and D. You know, they they, they had their, their labels, their titles as R and D tax specialists, etc. But their previous roles were um, insurance salespeople, car leasing salespeople, um, PPI salespeople. Um, so it's been it's very much a sales game. It's turned into. And so, you know, being careful there. And that's why you get a lot of advisors will be kind of, yeah, 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 go for it, go for it. And it's kind of they're after their fees. They 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 don't necessarily, I'm not speaking on behalf of all R&D specialists out there, but, you know, you tend to find the ones who've got qualifications and have professional bodies behind them. We have a duty of care to you as founders, entrepreneurs, and it doesn't necessarily apply to other outfits that are out there. Um, so, you know, we always put your best foot forward. Um, so just be aware of that. Do your due diligence, do your research on whoever you decide to go with. Um, the other thing I have to say is point three, lesson insight number three here. I mentioned in the first point about HMRC you can ask for uh, the R&D claim back. They can also go further than that and they will go further than that typically. They'll say, right, OK, we want the R&D claim back. And we also, we also want penalties because we believe you've been negligent in making that, that claim in the first place. That becomes really difficult in reality now because quite often HMRC are quite, um, I'm, I don't think I'm talking about terms to say they can be very harsh in their judgments. Um, I think they're stopping a lot of claims that are legitimate just because they're kind of very much a sort of sledgehammer at the moment, shutting the door on claims. So they're saying, right, you know, and a lot of companies are rolling over. They're saying, you know, I can't be bothered fighting this anymore. I'm tired. I've got a business to run. I can't be bogged down in this inquiry any further. It's mentally stressful and um, it's financially stressful. And therefore, I just want to sort of get out of it. So they kind of just say, yeah, yeah, whatever, just withdraw the claim. And then HMRC say, well, right, that's fine. We'll withdraw it. You know, we have the money back or we're not going to pay out in the first place. And uh, we'd like some penalties, please, um, for you making that claim. Um, now, ordinarily, you can get it down. Uh, on the basis that you know you've been cooperative in the process and a key one you have got an advisor in place and even more so for that, that um, there was a case that came out recently in which uh, a company 
did their research, or they thought they had a reputable advisor. The advisor said, yes, we think you've got a valid claim. They put the claim in HMRC, said, no, we don't think it's valid. And then they uh, sought a retrieval of that claim, and they also levied penalties. And this particular company, Fair Dues, then took HMRC to the tribunal, and they won. And the, the base that really was, they'd done all they reasonably could as a company, as a taxpayer. They'd noticed the relief. They got advice and assistance from, from a reputable advisor, and uh, the reputable advisor said, we think you qualify. So kind of what more could they have done in a, a reasonable company, a reasonable person on the street? And that was fine. So there is support that if you've got an advisor and you've done your due diligence on them, <coughs> excuse me, then you should be okay on the penalties. But they do go after them routinely. It's almost like a tick box for HMRC, right? I've stopped the claim or I've, I've reduced the claim. I'm now going for penalties on that, on that difference and it's usually a percentage 10 to 15 percent quite typically they'll go after um in most cases and then that kind of leads us on to number four in terms of e insights and i think this is this is a difficult one but it's about fee structures and it's been quite common uh, over the past 20 odd years for r d relief fees from advisors to be structured as success fees or contingent fees uh, based on the amount that they can get for you. Um, now, these have ranged. I mean, you still to this day, you see some quite horrific eye-watering rates of 30 40% that companies are charging uh, the clients on these um, claims. Now, as I mentioned, given the change in climate at the moment where HMRC can go after claims afterwards, it's not really a success fee to my mind unless you kind of don't pay the advisor for a year until the inquiry window shut which I don't think any advisor does that. Please let me know in the comments if you know of anyone. Um, so it's become increasingly difficult, in my personal view, for that fee structure to continue. Um, for that reason, and I think the other reason is that from an HMRC perspective, uh, the optics on it I don't think is great if and when HMRC challenge a claim, and they do sometimes ask for the engagement letter with the, with the advisor. And if the advisor is on a contingent fee, my view would be, and if I was an HMRC inspector, I'd be thinking this is, well, there's, an, there's a, um, an incentive for the advisor to push the boundaries, to push more. Well, let's up that percentage a bit more on that. Let's uh, do this. Let's do that. Let's just, yeah, let's extend the scope of the project to get more time into it, to get more costs into it so that they can up their, up the claim, which is the client, which is great. But equally, every pound more they're adding to the claim value, they may be getting, you know, 20, 30 percent of that as well. So... I don't think it looks great anymore. We work on the basis of a fixed fee now for clients. It's not a success fee. It covers our time and costs in, in preparing the claim. And I just feel in the current climate, that's probably the right way to go. But again, many will be different out there. And uh, you kind of pick which one you want. Um, but I think that kind of leads into this aspect of, um, you know, not being a have a go hero with it in the sense of you know oh just put a claim in yeah what could go wrong H must just say no well they don't just say no often you've got the the time and the uh, mental stress of dealing with an inquiry you've got HMRC asking for loads of questions asking for loads of information which they do if you do get an inquiry and then threat of penalties on top of that reputation risk with HMRC you know kind of on the radar um, and then you know it's that kind of aspect of well. It's not just a kind of just saying if they say no, you walk away. And there's that salesy tactic I think is going on about have a go here, just just get it in there, have a go. Proceed with caution. Um, the next one was around. Um, I think there's an aspect now that um, SMEs, certainly in startups, are seeing the R and D relief more and more as a um, source of finance. And it has been a great source of finance. And in the early stages, when you're developing a platform, you're developing a new product, it makes sense that there's a lot of potential R&D work there. Uh, if you're building something new, novel, extending knowledge, capability, all those good things, then you've got a good chance you've got R&D. But you imagine that kind of arc of R&D work. It kind of You imagine it's going to sort of do that because when you get to commercialization, uh, you've got clients, customers, there's probably going to be less R&D. I mean, it's, there's nothing wrong with a project uh, spanning a number of years, but it's, it doesn't necessarily go year. It's not a tap that goes year on year on year on year. Now, some companies who've got an R and D team sp specifically who are constantly on the cutting edge and they're working on new projects, uh, new products, new services. Potentially, that can be quite a f you know an ongoing thing. 
but for, I think the majority of SMEs who've got a limited resource in terms of team, you'd expect they're going to be drawn into customer work more, drawn into customer support, those people who might be more involved in the R&D work. So you kind of expect the R&D work to tail off. And I think there's a kind of tendency for SMEs and startups to go, you know, well, oh, I got 60 grand last year. I'm factoring 60 grand as my cash flow for next year and the year after and the year after. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, just think about where you are in your life cycle, or life cycle of your innovation and how that feeds into R&D and an expectation that possibly it's going to start tailing off. Um, and I think it's just been one of those things. And I think as time moves on and HMRC are more and more on top of this, and I think it becomes more and more critical that companies take a more measured approach here and look for alternative sources of finance to go along. It can't be this kind of cons constantly sort of drawing on this faucet of R&D tax credit relief. Um, I think it's going to happen going forward. It's just sort of factoring that in. And then kind of linking into that, um, there's this aspect of, I think, HMRC's compliance will ramp up. So already we're seeing there's, like in 22, 23, there was 90,000 claims went in, of which they inquired into about 10% of them. So pretty low, you know, one in 10, you know, nine in 10 chance, there are no inquiries coming through. Fast forward next year, the claims dropped off massively, I think partly due to this whole kind of change of approach of HMRC and it's starting to clamp down and news getting out there. Uh, the claims tailed off quite significantly in 24 to about 61,000 of which there was nearly 10,000 uh, challenges raised. So up to 17%, nearly 20%, only one in five being challenged. And we're seeing in certain sectors as more of a focus, certainly in kind of areas like retail, hospitality, care homes, all those areas where you really R&D, not so sure. Um, so, and software as well, because it's just so hard to prove and there's such a vast volume of claims going in. So I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to get cranked up even more. Um, I think, you know, given Rachel Reeves' recent budget statement where she's saying we're going to really clamp down on closing that tax cap and we're going to recruit more compliance uh, tax professionals, tax case workers or HMRC, I just think it's going to go up and up and up. And we did have, when we first started this back in 2000, we had regional units across the UK that were R&D specialist units and they did pretty much, as far as I remember, interview, check them all, basically. They would check all claims and then you knew pretty much they could pick the phone up to you and you know just check a few points oh checking this 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 yeah it's fine yeah oh, interesting project yeah it is yeah, yeah bosh that'll be through soon great um that's how it used to be in the good old days and um i think we might see something returning to that whether it be quite as um encouraging as it used to be i'm not so sure but uh certainly i think the claims will drop off in numbers even more and i think the, because the compliance will go up or the challenges will go up um so just being aware of that uh, unfortunately, it's climate going to be in pretty with caution. And then I think the final thing, key insight number seven, I think it's going to get even more difficult. Ooh, sort of doom and gloom here. But I think it's going to be even more difficult with this kind of massive convergence of technology advancements we're seeing more broadly. So stuff like AI, um, automation, etc. You know, you're seeing AI in particular is just swallowing stuff up at the moment. And, it's, you know, it's it's doing coding. It can, And already we're seeing, I mean, November 2024, what they're talking about, what can be done already. Can you imagine a year, two, three years' time what AI can do and how you're going to be able to prove uh, as a software company or something that the knowledge or capability didn't exist? You know, AI is going to help massively with that. And I'm not saying that it's going to stop completely, but the kind of... it it's getting harder and harder to say, well, there's no off-the-shelf solution and therefore, you know, we had to kind of scratch around and experiment with stuff. I think a lot of the heavy lifting is going to be done by these massive monolith companies that are creating these AI um, LLMs, or etc. And I think it's just going to get harder, 3D printing. Everything is coming together now in massive technological advancements more broadly. So perhaps we'll see less there in that aspect as well. Um, and what the key to this is making sure to get around this is, you know, if you are doing valid R&D work, is documenting as much as you possibly can about the state of play, the knowledge that was out there at the time when you're doing your projects. And then you can demonstrate why is how you are, you carved out from the kind of mass of knowledge that's already out there. So, I mean, that's kind of where we are. I think those are sort of seven kind of key points to be aware of. And these are kind of the broader the conversations I was having in a quite a depressing way. But I think equally being 
honest about it, I think is absolutely key. We have to have an honest conversation about where we are right now. Um, on the plus side, I do think that HMRC have been too harsh in many aspects. And we're now seeing that coming through in court cases where there's been some recently where they've lost um, one particular, if you're a software company called Get On Board. Uh, and that is was a great example of um, explaining how and why software can qualify still and a really useful aspect to it where it's sort of explained and we're seeing it's increasing where HMRC kind of just shutting the doors and saying computer says no uh, we don't think it qualifies but not really justifying why they think it qualifies and we get into a whole separate debate about the level of competence of some of those case workers and be able to assess what should and shouldn't qualify a uh, whole different debate there but Certainly the tribunal judge said in that particular case, you know, okay, this particular company had explained as much as it possibly could about the technical uh, advancements, the technical uncertainties. Now the evidential burden of proof has shifted to you, HMRC, to explain why you don't think it qualifies. And they didn't really do that. Uh, they just kind of said, no, 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 don't think it does. But why? Um, so that kind of fell through for HMRC, which is good news for the taxpayer, companies like yourselves. And... Other ones about subsidised expenditure came through recently, supporting the Quinn case. So there's and the the penalties one as well, where the taxpayer won that. So there are things out there in support, but the climate has moved on massively in the last two or three years. I don't think we'll see a massive change in the next two or three years. In all honesty, I think we'll see a lot of the same. So I think just getting your ducks in a row, getting some decent advice, professional advice and putting together a really robust claim with a load of documentation behind it is going to be paramount and um yeah that's that's kind of where we are right now in terms of state of play 2024 on the r&d tax relief um my name is steve livingston i hope that was useful